introduce Professor Olafemi Taiwo, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, um, where he pursues overlapping interests in metaethics, social and political philosophy, Africana philosophy, and environmental philosophy. He recently completed his PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles, um, and before that, completed bachelor's in philosophy and political science at Indiana University. Today, he's going to speak to us on the subject of it. He's going to give his talk entitled, let's put it that way, Reconsidering Reparations, and I would ask you all to help me welcome Professor Taiwo. Uh, so thanks to Professor Kazarian for putting this uh, event on, um, and thanks to everybody for coming out. Um, so the title of my talk is Reconsidering Reparations. Um, the subtitle of the talk is Justice in the Era of Climate Change. And, you know, if you'd asked me two years ago, I never would have thought I would give a talk that involved both of those things. Um, and I think it's hard from what I would describe as the current um, sort of orthodox understandings of reparations to see what these two things might have to do with each other. Um, but the reason for the regular title, Reconsidering Reparations, is that I think um, there's something missing from the conversation of reparations as it stands, at least in the academic literature. Uh, and so what I'm going to go on to talk about today are um, different ways I want to shake my fist at what academics have had to say about reparations. Um, and the overarching theme is, I think really none of the views that have been written up so far, at least few of them, um, really match the rationale that people on the ground, um, whether they be activists or civil society organizations or even political leaders, um, none of the current arguments in philosophical literature or legal literature, I think really capture what's going on when people who are pursuing activism or politically trying to achieve reparations explain what it is that they're going for. Um, and so I'm going to try to build a philosophical view that I hope um, critically engages with um, what's been said and I think is just a better argument. So here's the structure of the talk. Um, there are, I group the arguments in the academic literature as I find them into these two categories, harm repair arguments for reparations and relationship repair arguments. Um, I uh, take issue with both of these in different ways. Um, the view I prefer, I call the constructive view. Um, and then I'll go on to say what this constructive view, what this third way of thinking about reparations has to do with climate change. Um, but I think the best way to frame the whole talk that I am hoping to give today, or that I'm giving today, is uh, this quote from Dr. King. So the context from this, for this quote, uh, Why We Can't Wait is a book that came out in 1964, um, shortly after the um, civil rights uprising in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Birmingham, Alabama was uh, a place Dr. King had characterized as the most segregated city in the United States. Um, the level of pushback both in terms of state violence and sort of vigilante terrorism um, from the s people in the surrounding area um, was um, awe-inspiring. And in the year before, Dr. King had written um, what is called the Letter from Birmingham Jail, which is um, one of the best pieces of political work that got produced in that century, if you ask me. And he expressed frustration with um, white moderates, as he put it, who were too slow to um, support civil rights act action, um, who wanted to dilute the message of what they were fighting for. And I think the book that this excerpt is from expanded on those themes. Why We Can't Wait. Um, 
He's arguing that some people think we should wait for justice. And here's Dr. King's characterization of reparatory justice from the perspective of this criticism of white moderates. Uh, the Negro today is not struggling for some abstract, vague rights, but for concrete and prompt improvement in his way of life. What will profit him to be able to send his children to an integrated school if the family income is insufficient to buy them school clothes? What will he gain by being permitted to move to an integrated neighborhood if he cannot afford to do so because he is unemployed or has a low paying job with no future? During the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, a nightclub comic observed that had the demonstrators had been served, some of them could not have paid for the meal. The struggle for rights is at bottom a struggle for opportunities. So you could call this a kind of materialist outlook um, on what it is that the civil rights movement meant to him in generally, but I think especially the topic of reparatory justice. Um, and so we're going to take the two um, arguments in the academic literature, the harm repair arguments and the re relationship repair arguments, and see how they might be found wanting from this perspective. Just a little bit about how I'm going to structure the talk. Uh, I'm thinking of reparations not just domestically, not just in the US, but um, globally. So not just for slavery, but also for colonialism. Um, these, there are some key distinctions that I've marked up here, um, but I think we can take them as they go, but we can come back to the slide if it helps in the Q&A. Uh, so first, harm repair arguments. So the basic organizing principle of these sorts of arguments for reparations is the arguments work like this. The central claim is that reparations should repair present harms to individuals or groups. Um, and those harms that reparations is supposed to prepare, um, they're caused or perhaps even constituted by past harms. Um, so we're looking at the legacy of slavery or perhaps the continuing institution of slavery, depending on how we'd like to characterize the present moment in light of um, what we know about history. So there are three kind of themes that come up in this way of making reparations arguments. Um, one is that the way that harm is conceptualized in these arguments is broadly welfareist. And by welfareist, I mean it's about overall well-being in some sort of way. So there's a kind of natural model of harm that matches uh, most of our conversations about harm. Uh, I'm walking around, uh, minding my own business. Some things in my life are going well, some things are going badly. Um, add them all up and I'm at some level of welfare. And then you, um, you trip me, right? Or you take my bike. You do something to me that lowers me to a lower level of welfare. Um, and so we have easy answers both to the question of um, whether or not you've been harmed, uh, your welfare has been lowered, and the extent to which you've been harmed. What's the difference between your new level of welfare and your old level of welfare? Right? That's the basic understanding of harm that motivates um, these sorts of arguments. Uh, these arguments also operate on what I'm calling a corporate model of harm, responsibility, and liability. And all I mean by that is um, they're taking advantage of the way the, that our laws treat um, corporations, which, are, which is one model of how to treat groups of individuals. Um, so, you know, say whatever you want morally, but Mitt Romney had a point about how the law works. Uh, legally speaking, corporations are legal individuals, right? Um, which is to say that there are things that can be held responsible. Um, so, for example, if a group of employees of a corporation dump stuff in a river, um, they can, um, the law can take that corporation to court and hold it responsible as a collective entity. So it's being treated as an individual. And that's important because um, what we're dealing with in the conversation of reparations for transatlantic slavery and colonialism are groups of individuals. Not every single individual was, um, for example, a planter elite. Um, 
not every single individual um, owned slaves, not every single individual um, was even allowed to vote, right? So we need um, some sense of group identity, some way in which a group can collectively be held responsible. Um, and we find one model for that in the law as it already stands. Uh, the final thing I want to point out about these arguments is they work on a set of bifurcations. Um, and so the first one is just taking this legal metaphor um, to its most serious, right? So there's a plaintiff and a defendant side. There's a side that's been injured and that correspondingly is taken to have the right to petition for redress of that injury. Um, and there's a party, a group party, a corporate group party that's held responsible. Um, and that bifurcation is taken to be um, coextensive. It's supposed to split people in the same groups as these other bifurcations, uh, white and black. Right. So if you're white, it's presumed that you're in the um, that you're a defendant, and if you're black, you're a plaintiff. Right. Um, advantaged and disadvantaged. So um, if you're, it's supposed to be that the people who um, stand in the, who have standing to claim reparations um, are also the people who have been disadvantaged by um, the America's history of racial domination. Um, and finally, descended from enslavers and descended from enslaved. So these are ways of splitting people into two groups, and they're all supposed to split people into roughly the same groups. Now, I think immediately um, we can find a bunch of problems with this framework, right? Um, not everyone who is black is descended from enslaved people. For example, for, you know, I'm of immediate African descent. My parents came, my parents came from the continent. Um, so to my knowledge, I'm not descended from enslaved people. Um, there are plenty of white people who are, whose ancestry is recently, who recently immigrated. Um, who may have immigrated after the institution of slavery, right? Um, so there are a lot of, I think, obvious objections to whether or not all these groups are gonna line up. Um, and we can talk about those objections in the Q&A. Um, but actually, because of the particular kind of nerd I am, that's not the objection that I find most philosophically interesting. The objection I find most philosophically interesting is this one. It's what uh, is often called the non-identity problem or the counterfactual problem. Um, and the problem roughly goes like this. Uh, take that version of harm that I told you about before, the welfare's version of harm. How does it work? Well, you're at one level of welfare and someone comes along and does something to you and you end up at a lower level of welfare. But if that's what harm is, um, how could a hereditary system of oppression harm someone? If you're born in the condition of slavery, there's no previous level of welfare that you had before you were enslaved. There's just um, the unfortunate reality of slavery that you had to live through and endure. And we can take issue, uh, morally speaking, with um, slavery and with the treatment it caused, but it's not clear that we can make it out as harm, at least not on the version of harm that is most commonly used in harm repair arguments. Now, I think there are some things to say here, but um, I don't think they're promising. I think this objection is a serious problem to harm repair kinds of arguments. And so the second kind of argument that we consider relationship repair arguments um, are in part um, a response to that objection, to that particular problem with the harm repair arguments. Uh, people in the academic literature think um, there's this really tough to answer problem with harm repair arguments. Um, we need another way of making out what reparations might be about, what um, might make them a good idea. Um, what the best arguments for them are, even if those arguments are ultimately unsuccessful. Um, there's got to be a more charitable way of thinking about 
reparations that gives it a better chance of succeeding. And so uh, some of the people in the academic literature, especially philosophers, have adopted some version of this second category of argument, relationship repair. Um, and the people making these kinds of arguments broadly construed think something like this. Reparations should repair damage to relations between groups where that damage is caused or constituted by past wrongdoing. Um, so we should notice harm, at least the welfarist version of harm, doesn't show up here. The word harm doesn't show up here. Um, and as we're about to see, they think about what went wrong in slavery differently in a way that's supposed to avoid the objection we just talked about on the harm repair side. So one version of a relationship repair argument is a rights inheritance argument. Um, and the philosopher, African-American philosopher Bernard Boxall um, observes that um, John Locke, who's a famous philosopher, uh, often considered the father of liberalism, um, gave an argument that's <coughs> really friendly to this way of making out reparations. Um, in L Locke's famous book, Second Treatise of Justice, he identifies the right to reparation as a natural right. Um, so it seems like a good place to look. Um, but you wouldn't have to use Locke. Um, there are other ways that you can make this argument out. And the basic commitment of the argument um, is basically there's a relationship between A and B and where A is perhaps white people or the United States federal government or both and B is black people or the descendants of the enslaved. Um, and a way of characterizing that relationship that gives um, African Americans the right to demand reparations from whoever is group A. And here's how it works. Uh, it's a two-stage argument. So if we imagine ourselves back in the middle of the 19th century, um, where there are people around who are right then living in, under the condition of slavery, um, there's a really unambiguous sense in which they've been wronged, in which they have been um, treated in a way incompatible with the right kind of moral relationship. Um, and the thought is that the sense in which those people, people who actually were enslaved, um, the sense in which those people deserve reparations is unambiguous, right? They lived through slavery, they survived those harms, etc. If they had been paid reparations, um, if they had been given something of lasting economic value or perhaps political value, that's something they could have passed along to their children, right? And so the failure on, on the white or US federal government side, the failure to pay reparations generates a moral debt. And on the African American side, the um, people in the 19th century who would have deserved reparations had something like a moral credit or a moral claim right to whatever amount of reparations would have been the right one. And both of those are, her are inheritable. Um, so just like um, when a person dies and um, their economic estate, their land, their money is passed to their children net of their debts, um, in that same sense, the only, um, the only privilege and money that um, white descendants of enslavers are entitled to is what their ancestors gave them net of the reparations they ought to have paid. And similarly, on the other side, um, African Americans now are, have a claim right, have a moral credit, you could say, to some form of reparations. Um, so there's a lot of appealing about that argument. Uh, here's the second kind. On this view, what's important are the community relationships 
that the interpersonal or intergroup relationship between A and B, between the US federal government and African Americans, or between white Americans and African Americans, um, the way that that relates to the broader health and moral, um, moral life of the community. So the community is both of the site of repair and the thing that is to be repaired by reparations. Um, and reparations serves an expressive purpose. So our relationships with each other are moral ones um, in order for us to interact with each other in moral ways as opposed to ways characterized by sheer coercion and domination or strategy. Um, we have to have shared values and we have to have reason to trust that other people will continue to act on those shared values, not just today, but also tomorrow, in order for us to keep those um, moral relationships healthy. And the non-payment of reparations effectively communicates, um, we don't really think slavery was that bad, um, which in turn effectively communicates uh, perhaps if things go the wrong way, um, we could get back to something like that kind of moral injustice. And so the point of reparations is to firmly repudiate that past. So I think there's a lot, I think a lot of ground was gained in the development of this kind of argument. But you'll notice that in neither version of relationship repair do we maintain the focus on what African Americans' lives are like, what opportunities they have. Um, on the first version, um, they could have gained that moral credit whether or not the rest of their lives went well. So, so you don't have to talk about mass incarceration um, to talk about what's important about paying your debts, right? On this version, um, what's important is the relationship between white Americans and African Americans and not, say, the relationship between African Americans and their own goals or their own life chances, et cetera, et cetera. So these relationship repair arguments avoid a particular philosophical challenge to the earlier harm repair arguments, but they only accomplish that by effectively changing the subject. Um, and in particular, the way they change the subject, especially on this view of reparations, um, would have you think that the point of reparations is for us to like each other and be on good terms. Right. Um, so ultimately, reparations becomes symbolic or gestural. And I think that gives up the kind of framework for reparations that's available um, and that I would argue Dr. King um, had in mind. Um, giving that up in favor for holding out for the possibility that um, the relationships between white and black people are of paramount importance. And they might not be important, you know. You might credibly think that at some point in history, people are going to give up trying to repair relationships. Um, and instead, they're going to have other goals, right? Okay, so two sets of problems with the literature. On the one hand, you have harm repair arguments, which are motivated by material, by the material lives of black people, by um, what they have access to, by what their opportunities are like, by what their resources are like, um, in ways that present day black people are suffering from a variety of things that are connected to um, the history of slavery and institutional racism. Um, but they face a lot of challenges on the justification side. Um, it's hard to make those arguments do the justificatory work we'd want them to do for reparations. 
On the justificatory side, relationship ar repair arguments are very strong. It's easy to say, um, it's easy to say why reparations is a good idea, is a worthwhile idea on the relationship repair view. Um, but it's harder to say what relationship, if anything, if any relationship, um, reparations has to do with the given reality of black suffering, of black disadvantage um, in the present moment. You can make all those arguments even if it had turned out that black people were doing very well. Right? They just, there's no role for mater the material problems that face black people in those arguments at all. Um, so with a cape on flies in the constructive view. Um, the idea is to try to split the difference, to salvage what was good about the harm repair arguments, the material focus, but do so without changing the subject. Uh, so here's the first pass at it. Uh, reparations is a political project to create tomorrow's just world um, and justly distribute the cost of that creation in light of yesterday's injustice. And I'm going to talk through that a little bit slower. So <coughs> here are the main aspects of the view. Um, the first one is already an interesting contrast with the views we've seen so far. Um, the con on the constructive view, reparations isn't supposed to repair um, the damage of slavery. Um, the damage is done. The damage is irreparable. Um, but it's supposed to construct something. It's supposed to build something new, something worth having. The kind of justice that reparations turns out to be um, isn't retributive justice. It's not relationship repair. It's not um, community management. But it's actually distributive justice. And I think uh, this point needs a bit of a closer look. So what's distributive justice? Uh, distributive justice is a topic, um, it's an, in political philosophy, it's an aspect of justice that's concerned with who has what, who has what stuff, who has what rights, who has what responsibilities, who has which burdens in terms of how our political communities operate. And we could try to um, think that time, we could try to answer those questions, we should try to, we could try to think of an ideal distributive state of the world uh, without reference to history. We could just look at how much, how many people have um, clothes, how many people have clean water, um, what everyone's relative income is, and compare that to some ideal. So, so maybe a completely egalitarian ideal where we think everyone should have the same, or maybe a minimal utility ideal where we think everyone should have enough, a kind of sufficient level. Um, and we could just specify those ideal distributions um, and then criticize our current world based on the differences from our current world and that ideal. Um, so that would be as if we just took a snapshot of where everyone is now, the access to resources everyone has now, everyone's income now, um, and just compared it with the ideal and tried to scoot it towards that ideal. So if we were egalitarians, we say, here's the global average. That's how much everyone should have. If you have more than the average, then we got to take mo money from you. If you have less than the average, we got to give money to you. That's one approach that we could take. Um, and as I hope you can tell from my description of it, I don't think there's much to be said for that approach. Um, because another thing that we might be interested is, in is how everybody got to the level of income or resources they have now, right? Um, you know, maybe we have a problem with people being very rich um, in and of itself, um, but certainly we might have additional problems if, we, if they became very rich by exploiting the suffering of other people. And maybe it would go some distance to justify someone being extraordinary, extraordinarily rich if they got that way by working very hard, right? That's what a lot of our ideological debates are about. 
Um, so even without supposing any particular answer to the question of whether or not people should be very rich, um, I think it's enough to say we care why it is that people have what they have now. Um, we care about the explanation for why those people are poor, why those people are rich, why these people have the right to freedom of speech, the right to dress the way that they would like, the right to date who they would like, um, and why they don't. We're, we're interested in the historical explanations for those things. And I think once our view of distributive justice, once we admit, I'll put it, once we admit that our view of distributive justice is historical, that we are interested in um, why people ended up with the allocations that they have now, then we can see why this supposed tension um, isn't one. So here's, the, here's a problem you could have with the constructive view. Um, reparations accounts, um, the ways of reparation, the ways of thinking about arguments for reparations that we're used to are backward looking. Something bad happened a century ago. Um, we've got to deal with that thing. Maybe we have to deal with the negative effects of that thing as they show up in the present. Um, but the thing that reparations is, is responding to is a past event. The opposite is true of conventional discussions of distributive justice. We're thinking, well, we just need to identify a target. Maybe it's complete egalitarianism. And then we have to figure out how to get from here to there, which will happen in the future. Um, I don't think there's any tension at all in these two things. And I think um, it's exactly this um, forward and backwards distinction that the constructive view exploits. Um, so there's a division of labor. Um, Forward-looking considerations help us establish the target. So, so say we're committed to total egalitarianism. We say, that's the version of the world we need to end up in, the version of the world where everyone has the same amount of stuff. But as soon as we say that, um, and we have to decide that by reference to our values and our political goals and so on and so forth, um, but as, as soon as we work that out, then we have a, then we have a um, important next question. And the cause of that next question is this. We have to do stuff in the world to change it from this distribution to any other distribution. Right? We have to take action. Um, it will be costly. There will be burdens. And there will be benefits. And so those costs of transition from the unjust world, the unjust distribution, um, to the just distribution, are themselves things that we have to distribute. Here's where the backward-looking considerations come in. Um, backward-looking considerations inform distributions of benefits and burdens of the transition to the target state of affairs. Um, so here's an example. 1946, uh, continental Europe. Um, you have this. You could take a snapshot, right? You could just see where everyone's at in terms of um, welfare. Um, one thing you might notice if you took a snapshot of continental Europe in 1946 is that you have um, a lot of very unhappy, very extremely traumatized people um, who have lost house and home and who are nationless. And if you were to ask that question historically, if you were to look back and ask how they ended up that way, um, you might find that there was this whole Third Reich, and they opened up these miserable death camps and pursued this very heinous period of history, right? And so on the constructive view, you would say something like, well, first of all, we've got We've got to get these people a place to live, ways to provide their material needs. We have to change this unjust aspect of the world. But that's going to cost money. And you know who should pay for it? The people responsible for putting them in this bad position. And that is, in fact, what happened. Um, they had accounting estimates of how much um, 
property was expropriated from Jewish businesses um, in much of continental Europe. Um, and the present value of a lot of the investments that went under. If they had wanted to, they could have given a harm repair welfareist kind of view of reparations, right? They could have just said, well, you took this much money from these people, you should give them that much money back. But that's actually not how, um, that's not the bulk of how it was, of how much reparations it was decided that Germany had to pay. Um, actually, what they did was they said, well, here's the thing we have to do in the future to make this right. We need to resettle all these people. What, is, what are the costs of resettlement? And Germany must pay some high percentage of those costs, right? Now, obviously, the history from there becomes very complicated. Um, so, so I'm not meaning to say that that's a historical example that we should replicate in every way. Um, but I think the, that aspect, um, the use of forward-looking considerations to distribute the cost of transition to a more just world, I think that is a thing, that is a lesson to take from this historical example. Um, so here's how we get to climate change. Uh, say we were to do that for... Um, say, the African Americans in the United States, or black people in the Caribbean, especially in the island nations, or the continent of Africa. Um, say we were to say um, there's a more just world where we undo some of the, or we respond constructively to the effects of transatlantic slavery and colonialism, and we've got to get there somehow. Um, so we're going to have a policy plan that's going to get us to a fairer world. As soon as we started drawing up forecasting plans for any policy initiative, uh, we would be smacked in the face by the looming uh, present reality of climate change and its intensifying effects. It would be hard. I would be hard pressed. I just can't do it. I can't name you a long-term policy initiative that has any significance in a world that is four degrees centigrade hotter by the end of the century than pre-industrial levels. Um, the current debate about a global average of 1.5 degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius um, is about a global average, but temperature is not evenly distributed across the globe. And estimates for several regions in Africa are up to double um, these numbers um, for um, what we would be looking at, even if we took the Herculean effort of limiting climate change to these temperatures. Um, so the crisis of climate change for the African continent in particular and Caribbean island nations, I think it's not an exaggeration to say is literally existential. This picture was taken yesterday. Um, this is Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, or it was, I guess I should say. Uh, these are climate protesters. These are youths who are demanding um, comprehensive, um, green, climate-friendly legislation. Um, and. I've come to the weird conclusion that I don't even like, but I think is inescapable, that to the extent that there's reparations activism in this day and age, this is what it looks like. Thank you. So, we have, wait, let me get my, I need my clock so I know what's going on here. We have, half an hour to have a substantive q and I'm sure that there are lots of people with questions. So I'm going to play moderator and run around with the microphone. And all right, who's our first? Okay. Just, you can just leave it there. Just, sure. 
So I have a couple of questions, but because other people have questions, so I start with one. If I got time, I ask my other questions. So first question is this: Suppose that you are like pretty well off, right? And you are not you, your or your ancestor haven't been involved in any kind of wrongdoings. As a matter of like distributive justice, you owe something to the poor, right? But now suppose that the other person was involved in some kind of hard thing. So he also owes something to the poor. But there should be like the one who was involved owes something like more. Or or there's at least a difference. But on your account, so it's so my question basically is a clarificatory question. So it seems that you couldn't say so if it's a, if reparation if reparation is a matter of like distributive justice, so why should be any difference between you and the other person? And if there is any difference, where that difference comes from? It's not from distributive justice, so there should be another source. So this is my, my first question. Good, that's a good question. Um, so I think on, on accounts of distributive justice conventionally understood, there isn't a difference, right? Because the thing that generates the obligation um, to give money to the poor is having, you know, is the inequality. It's just the inequality, the bare fact of inequality or deviation from the ideal distribution, I think is the fair thing to say, right? Um, but that's importantly, that's the, that's the bone I'm picking with distributive justice, right? So I think your frame, your frame is right, um, that um, if you have two rich people, one of whom was materially involved or a beneficiary of whatever historical process made um, some third poor person poor, um, the second rich person owes something to the poor person that the first rich person doesn't, right? So we agree about that. Um, and the view that I'm trying to make out is, um, Person also owes something? Yes. Like the, the, the first person, the one who wasn't involved? Yes. So you, you agree with that too? Yes. So both owe, the, the harming one in, like owe more? Right. So why? Good. Um, so, so the historical considerations that explain why, person, why rich person one and rich person two um, are rich also help explain how we distribute the burden of moving from the status quo to the better ideal distribution, right? So the fact that we're, the fact that there's the bad kind of inequality, all that does is say we should be, we should be at a better distribution. It doesn't yet answer the question of how we should distribute the cost of transitioning to that new one. Um, and the fact that the second rich person is responsible for the third person's poverty helps explain why that person should pay an outsized amount of costs to get us to the better distribution. Can I just ask, what do you mean by responsible? You don't mean that he harmed him, right? Because the harm account is wrong. So if he didn't harm him on your account, yeah, it's um, so so one. Uh, one distinction that I talk about in the paper that I did not get to in the talk is the distinction between responsibility and liability. There we go. All right. Um, so first of all, there's different kinds of responsibility, but I think the important distinction here is between responsibility and liability. Um, so responsibility, um, or at least a normal notion of responsibility might say that um, the sorts of things that you have to compensate other people for are the sorts of things that you did, right? So that's the kind that ties tightly to harm. But that's not actually how the, but, that's not how the law actually treats liability, which is a different notion. Liability is just responsibility to pay costs for something, right? Um, so there's a legal notion of strict liability, where 
um, there's actually no requirement of, of fault finding at all. It's just, did the person get harmed in your restaurant? Um, under strict liability, you would just be liable regardless if they were harmed because of their own incompetence or because of yours, right? Um, I think liability is the notion that, um, on the constructive view at least, would be the notion of sharing costs. So we wouldn't be thinking, I mean, one way to explain why the second rich person it should pay more to the third poor person is because the, they're responsible, but it wouldn't be the only way. We might say, if you're in the group of people that is causally downstream of this system of exploitation, if you're from the colonizer nation and the poor person is from the colonized nation, there are, way, there are different ways that we could run it. But we might just say, you are liable, which doesn't require that we hold you responsible. I'm gonna go for, I think I saw Patrick first, but that was just because I looked there, but you win. Yeah. <laughs> so to what extent is like our historical considerations overlapping with kind of an idea of like ability to contribute? Like we can say that like these kinds of historical disadvantages put these people in a position where they don't have the kinds of resources to make sacrifices to kind of bring us towards this more ideal distribution. So to what extent like, is that kind of part of our explanation for the historicity of this? Or is it just entirely historic where you could have suffered greatly before and, I don't know, won the lottery or something, and you would still be expected to make greater contributions because you can make them, even if historically bad things happened to you? Right. Um, so, so definitely both kinds of considerations need to be in the picture, right? So. Um, I'm just going to keep using the Germany-Israel example because I think it's just stark. Um, if we're looking at the people in 1946 who need assistance and the people who are economically positioned to give assistance, that includes the people who are better off than Holocaust survivors. That includes way more people than the Germans, right? Um, that's going to include every nation that wasn't you know, destroyed by the war um, or didn't have its ec economy wrecked by the war. Um, but so historical reasons are going to help say why Germany should bear the brunt of the cost rather than any other country with a that could develop um, the ability to pay. Right. Um, but your other point still matters. So say, you know, there are actual contemporary examples of this. So, you know, Spain's in a bit of a fiscal crisis, um, but was one of the OG empires, right? One of the original colonizers of much of the world. Um, it may turn out for exactly the reasons that you're highlighting that uh, Spain's gonna have um, less overall liability than, say, the United States. Um, not because Spain's historical responsibility is lower, but because historical responsibility is only one of the categories we'd be considering. We'd also be considering a willingness to pay, um, and that and the United States' greater willingness to pay might dominate the extent to which Spain is more historically responsible for um, the aftermath of colonialism. Okay, first I'd like to say thank you very much for this talk. I found it really interesting. Uh, and so one thing that struck me is that there's an interesting kind of contrast between climate justice and other kinds of reparations because the costs of climate change are going to be borne by future generations, whereas ordinarily we think of reparations as rectifying injustice that already happened. Mm -hmm. And so I guess just one question connected to that um, might be, can we make sense of the notion of owing reparations to groups of people who don't exist yet? I guess that would be the most straightforward question I could ask. <coughs> yeah. Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is, um, 
Yeah, responsibility to a future to future persons is another kind of minefield. <laughs> and I've just, you know, like the reason I don't like this argument is not I actually think it's right, you know, uh, I, otherwise I wouldn't make it. But but I, I just think, you know, this is a nightmare. This 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 argument just ruins three different conversations. <laughs> Like the climate change people don't want to talk about reparations, the reparations people don't want to talk about climate change, and nobody wants to talk about whether future people are the bearers of responsibilities and obligations, right? Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I do think it's coherent. Um, and I actually think we couldn't make sense of a lot of our institutional commitments in the absence of at least something functionally like that kind of a commitment, right? Like why do we continue to follow the rules? Well. Um, or maybe this is a better way to put it. Um, take an institution like a university, right? Um, is it coherent for someone to say, you should keep up the ethos of the university or you should keep up the norms of the university um, without them pr picking out particular ways in which that would harm you or your present colleagues? I think it is coherent. And I think maybe one reason why is because we're imagining that this institution is gonna persist um, and future iterations of that institution are gonna go on to affect other people. So I think that's good enough, you know. Yeah, thanks. Um, so <clears throat> I wanna say I really like the combination of the backward and forward looking approach. I think it's really promising. Uh, the place I was sort of, what made me, this is, I don't know if this is really an objection, but I was, when we started talking about those sort of simplified models with like say the two, the two rich people, right? Uh, I think it produces a weird sort of puzzle and I think it's maybe just because it's a very simplified model, but I'll just sort of throw it out there and then, and then we can sort of talk about it. So imagine like we have, our society has like four people. So there's two rich people, uh, two people who've been the sort of product of injustice over, over decades, generations or what have you, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, good idea. Uh, ah, uh, <laughs> got one. You got one? <laughs> we have the innocent rich person. We have the, the guilty you. rich person, right? Okay. And so, and now we, we have some model, forward-looking model of distributive justice. To make it really simple, let's say everyone deserves the same amount of stuff, right? Okay. Uh, so the goal is to get to that model, which means that R1 and R2, they should end up with the same amount of money if we achieve that ideal state. But the backwards-looking part of your account says that the guilty rich person should be <coughs> paying more to achieve that state, which means they should not end up with an equal distribution at the end of the day. So it seems like the backward looking and the forward looking components are potentially in, t in tension in this, in this sort of weird example. Uh. Okay, that's the puzzle, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so both of these people have um, $100, they're rich, and oppressed people have $1. And we're supposed to end up in a world where everybody has $50. Um, oh, I, I don't think these, this is the whole world. I think these, we're just picking out people in the world, right? Um, so, so, I, know, I was but, but good. this is the whole world. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. $200, yeah, everybody gets 50. A, a second uh, $0 person, just make it everybody gets $25. That's yeah, yeah. Really easy way to Let's so, do it. It's so simple Let's that do there's it. only four people in this. Exactly. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Wait, we need, a, we need a fourth person? Yeah, Throw a fourth just person a, in there, just for fun. Fourth $0 person. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't this assumption require that like, the resource pool is fixed? If I imagine that they're going to be... Yeah, we're not going to deal with that. Later. <laughs> <laughs> so on this model, it seems like to achieve justice, everyone should have $25. Right. But the problem is, 
the backward looking side of your account is saying the guilty person needs to contribute more to achieving that state, which means that they should not have the same amount of money as the other rich person. And so the backward, it's, it's just intention with the two. Yeah, so, so, so here's the thing I was hoping to exploit, and let's see if we think it works out. Um, so the, the thing that I'm trying to exploit is, this is, a, this is a description of a state, of a state of affairs, right? These are both descriptions of state of affairs. This is a description of a process. So there are actually costs associated with this process, and some of them are non-monetary, maybe some of them are, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but that's, that's why I'm appealing to the word burdens as opposed to, right? Um, so, so it might be that they're both supposed to submit the same size checks, but this guy has to carry the checks to the post office. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> but but whatever, whatever work, labor, costs are involved, burdens are involved here, this is the thing um, that um, the costs of this are what's distributed, not the net transfer from here to here. Hi, so I'd like to start off thanking you for the talk. I thought it was a very interesting talk. I had a broad question about uh, reparations conversations generally, okay. and it's, it's kind of like a pragmatic sort of question. Underlying all of this conversation, all of the points of view is a, a perspective of conflict between one party and another. And it usually takes a tone of like the government or white people being the uh, oppressor party. And those are precisely the parties that are being appealed to for reparations. So uh, I guess my question would be, if that party is inimical enough to demand reparations, aren't they inimical enough to make this a sort of exercise in futility? Yeah. Um, so the rhetorical version of this is a nightmare, right? Um, ultimately, you know, what I'm asking people to do is first blame yourselves for why other people's lives suck um, in some kind of historical, you know, I, I mean, like talking outside of the realm of theory. This is essentially the pragmatic effect of what I'm saying. All right, first of all, blame yourself in some extended collective sense for what's wrong with those people's lives and then give up your stuff so that they can have better lives. All right, and so I'm not walking into you know, I'm not walking into your average PTA meeting saying, you know, check out the constructive view, right? So, so, <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, I, I want to do the cop out philosopher thing and just be like, I just want, I, I want to start off by just figuring out what I think the right view is and then working from there to um, a political project of how I make this manifest in the world. Um, I, I, I do think that's a cop-out answer, but I think the reason it's a cop-out answer is that usually the right view is somewhere close to the thing that you would say to people to get them to believe or to act in the way that you would like. Like usually there's a tighter relationship um, and the relationship is just so distant in the case of reparations. Like th this is just not what I would say if I were trying to make this happen. Well, the only issue I see with that is like, it the whole argument imputes like a sort of uh, malevolence on the party, but then the solution projects a sort of goodwill. Like it, it's very likely to me, like I could see this being proven like absolutely technically correct. And then you present it to the party uh, that reparations would come from and they could simply answer like, I don't care. Like, isn't that what they've always done? It seems like the best you could hope for is a sort of Trojan horse that like uh, appeases the oppressed parties, but doesn't really help any conditions. So let me answer your question squarely, and then I'll point at this. Um, I don't think it's malevolence that's being attributed to white people. And I think, at least not on my argument, um, because I'm exploiting the difference between moral responsibility and liability. And I'm not the first to do that by any means, right? Um, the, the argument is just something like, you know, you, your partner comes home with a bag of money and they work in a trade where coming home with a bag of money is not a suspicious thing. I'm not sure what trade that is, but spot me this, right? <laughs> 
and, and someone comes by tomorrow and says, actually, this particular bag of money was stolen from, you know, the bodega um, at the end of the corner. <coughs> I think that person can just ask you for the money back. They're not saying you're a terrible person because your partner did this thing, right? They're just saying, oh, this thing that showed up in your household and would have enriched your life if you kept it, you actually should give it back, right? That, that's, that's all my argument needs. That's all I want. That's all I think is appropriate. Um, so, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to concede the malevolence point, um, but I do think your next, your second point is apt anyway. Why can't white people just say, fuck y'all, um, you know, Certainly, they've proved that they can do this historically. <laughs> I think that's, that's fair to say. Um, you know, I, I think the one glimmer of hope, the one aspect of this argument that isn't a clear loser from a rhetorical perspective is this. Because if you're asking, if you're asking people um, in a world that globally needs to reduce the emissions um, that needs to um, generate negative emissions, things that take carbon out of the atmosphere. If you ask them to help build a plant in Namibia, which will take some carbon out of the global atmosphere, and you ask them, and, and you know, Namibia's like, oh, you know, we're gonna get this new technology and maybe they'll pay rent for it. You know, there's a clear interest Namibia has, but there's actually something that you can say to the US or to the European Union as to what's in it for them. Because it turns out it's the same sky, right? Not exactly, but you know, close enough, right? Um, it, it turns out the parts per million in the globe is concretely, materially relevant to their interests. Um, and so, you know, it turns out that just doing the right thing would actually, would in a real way promote the interests of these places. And so we might actually be able to get the rich countries of the world and the rich sectors of any country to do the right thing for once. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, while I like the distributive justice model, um, lovely argument, um, historically it would be very difficult, let me rephrase that. Um, the actual history is very messy. Yeah. Uh, it would be difficult to identify whose money is dirty, to put it this way. Uh, while I was delighted to find an old family Bible that seemed to indicate that some of my ancestors were abolitionists, uh, it's probably the case that some of the other money that has supported me um, is tied to slave owners, or to the slave trade, or to the financial people who, uh, in this part of the world, uh, exploited the cotton trade, uh, and so on. So I'm not sure that once you, once you start trying to figure that stuff out, that it's going to work all that well. Uh, or at least I'd like to hear what you have to say to that. And, and then I guess the, other, the only other remark I had was um, I actually like the 46 argument because um, the Marshall Plan does seem to me to be a very interesting historical event that, <coughs> that sort of actualized a lot of what I think you're, you're trying to, to get at. Yeah. So, so in reverse order, yeah, I, the Marshall Plan is very specifically the thing I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, and hopefully I'll eventually find a way to just say it explicitly. But yeah, I think it, I just agree. Um, as for the first point, yeah, I, I mean, I think capitals never respected borders. Um, it's never respected our you know, various forms of social organization. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, one of the problems with the, I'm not gonna scroll back to the slide, but <laughs> one of the problems, the, the thing that 
is worst about the harm repair bifurcations that it makes um, is the mapping of advantaged and disadvantaged onto all the others. Um, I think it's just at least materially true that if you are very well off, if you are very materially well off, if you are very politically well off, you are a net beneficiary of the various forms of injustice that produce the world. Doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter what your pronouns are. I think that's just true. Um, people yell at me for saying this, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's just true. Um, and, and so that particular split is not going to line up to produce the plaintiff defendant categories that we want with reparations. Um, if the thing we're trying to track is something like um, the dirtiness of our money in a responsibility-laden way. So I think this is one of the important things about um, liability as the kind of operative responsibility-esque concept in the argument. Um, who's on the hook for paying? Well, how dirty, really? Um, so, so I think it's something like, um, you know, if you work for Halliburton or something, you know, maybe your maybe your money's dirtier <laughs> than <laughs> if you work for the fraternal order of the Dominicans. Now, <laughs> I, I don't know why that was my. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> that, that was a terrible example. <laughs> but, but <laughs> oh no, it was probably oh no, no actually uh, on the one side on the one side it was a good example on the other side not so much. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just don't go with Jesuits next time. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Although, get in trouble. They at least are taking a shot at something. Yeah, they like justice, <laughs> sort of. You work for them. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, with everyone else, I thought that was great. Uh, I will put my cards on the table. I like harms theory. It's great. Uh, <laughs> and so I was trying to think about that, and I was I liked your model, but I was trying to think about cases where the costs of transition and culpable harms come apart. So case, and, and I have intuitions about these cases that I think reveal me to be a harms person, so I want to ask you. So in one case, uh, culpable harms uh, way outpace the costs of transition. So, uh, yeah, so we say, I mean, you know, the, the, the uber-rich descendant of the slave owners can pay a slight little, a little tiny bit of money, and that gets the right transition. Um, and there I have the sense, oh, well, you shouldn't just, it shouldn't just be a, like a little, you know, like a, an inconvenience fee if you have been mammothly enriched. If, if you've caused culpable harms, but you can fix it cheap, I think you're getting away with something maybe. But then in the other case, where costs are mammoth, but culpable harms are low, uh, there I think, uh, so, so my intuition is, in fact, the, uh, the culpable harms of our, this history are really high. But if you imagine that they were low, uh, but that the costs of transition for various reasons were high. So if you thought, well, lots of other things have happened in history, and so getting to 25 each is going to be really expensive, and it's going to be way more expensive than the culpable harms. My intuition there is, well, having this person who's a little bit culpable pay this mammoth cost is disproportionate. And my intuition in the other case was having this person who's really rich pay this minimal cost was unjust enrichment. Right. So those are just me confirming I'm a harms person. <laughs> but I'm curious what you think about those cases. Yeah, so, so I'm at least very sympathetic to the motivation behind them. So like you can imagine um, maybe we just put in some kind of weird infrastructure that just makes this really costly for, for some weird reason, right? That has nothing to do with how bad the history that produced mm -hmm. this was. That would count for something in terms of um, um, specifying how we distribute the costs of this transition. Uh, I would just prefer to explain it um, differently, right? Because at the end of the day, um, um, let's call this the uh, status quo. Uh -huh. yeah. um, 
ability to pay, liability for status quo, um, connection of Uh, the connection of, so, so let me add one complication to help show why this is my answer. So, so say, um, you know, the thing that you actually did was, um, the history is such that um, the rich people got rich because they, not because they wanted to, let's say the oppression was like, Picking the right, picking, getting to pick the cool colors for the town baseball team, right? And, and that, you know, a very mild thing. But um, the infrastructure that they use to exclude people from that also, you know, bifurcated the town's, you know, grid or whatever, whatever. Um, the actual thing that they did wasn't very weighty. But the reason this transition is expensive is because of the thing that they did. So in that case, I would want to say um, the harm, you know, the culpable harm of the oppression itself isn't that weighty, but the historical explanation in a broad sense still explains distributing most of the cost to the rich people um, because um, of the connection of the transition costs with the thing that explains the original history. So, so what I'm trying to get at with that is that I think it's actually, I think the, what, we're, what we're really fighting about is the ethics of distributing the cost of transition in a very direct kind of way. Um, and that's where I want the debate, right? I, I don't think that to think that all these things matter and none of them settle by themselves how we should distribute the cost. I think that's a good intuition. We need it, right? We need to keep it. Um, but I don't think that requires the harm view um, because I think the constructive view can accommodate that. Just kind a couple of you. Yeah. yeah. I hate to be that guy, but we have to give up the room. And so we are out of time, and I would like to ask all of you to help me thank Professor Taiwo for a totally fascinating talk.